Hi, I am Josh Sawyer. I'm the project director and lead designer on Pillars of Eternity at Obsidian Entertainment. Today we're going to be looking at the beginning of the game, which includes character creation, and it is a thrill ride. So Pillars of Eternity was a Kickstarter-backed game. We had 77,000 backers. We raised about $4 million over the course of the Kickstarter campaign. And what they were backing was a game in the spirit of the Infinity Engine games, which were games developed by Black Isle Studios and Bioware using Bioware's Infinity Engine in the late 90s and early 2000s. The big emphasis for us is on exploration of beautiful 2D environments, tactical combat with a full party using a real-time with pause combat system, and a really rich and reactive story that you go through with your cool, cool party of companions. Those are a big part of the Infinity Engine games, and so that's what we've been focusing on. Uh, so now we're going to be jumping in and taking a look at the beginning of the game, and it's a hoot. Uh, so this game is set in a new setting we've developed at Obsidian called Aora. Uh, this part of the world is the Eastern Reach. It's an area that's been heavily colonized. Lots of people from different parts of the world are coming in and settling in this area. But there are old ruins here that lots of people love to pick over and take little goodies out of to take back to the old world and sell, and that causes a lot of conflict with the the folks who are the locals who regard the ruins as sacred. So lots of potential for gnarliness here. Um, so you come into this part of the world as part of a caravan. Uh, caravans bring lots of people into the colonial areas, but your caravan winds up stranded a little bit. Uh, as you're coming in, you find that the road is blocked. Uh, the caravan master doesn't really want to stop the caravan because you're near some lots of potential for gnarliness here. Um, so you come into this part of the world as part of a caravan. Uh, caravans bring lots of people into the colonial areas, but your caravan winds up stranded a little bit. Uh, as you're coming in, you find that the road is blocked. Uh, the caravan master doesn't really want to stop the caravan because you're near some of these ruins that are very dangerous for uh, outsiders to come near, but he doesn't really have a choice because there's no other way around this fallen tree. So he says, okay, so everyone set up camp, <clears throat> but watch out, their locals are probably watching us and we can't be caught going into these ruins. Any answer but silence. Five wagons grope blindly for the path on a starless night. Their master glancing ever upward to the skies for assurance that he is on the right course. A dim lantern, his only protection against the encroaching darkness, but the skies bring no comfort shining no light, betraying no hint of what they know. The caravan carries travelers bound for the frontier hamlet of Gilded Vale, you among them, where a local lord has offered land and wealth to settlers from abroad looking for a fresh start. You have taken suddenly ill, sweat. Character creation is a pretty big deal in a game like this. We want to make sure that it lives up to people's expectations of the Infinity Engine tradition, so you have a lot of options in character creation. You can make a male or female character, which all the Infinity Engine games other than Planescape Torment and Support Hidden. Uh, you have a lot of different races that you can select from. During the Kickstarter campaign, we expanded to a total of six races. We have the traditional humans and elves and dwarves. Uh, we have some new races we created, the Amala and the Orlans. Amala are a large semi-aquatic race. The Orlans are kind of our replacements for gnomes and halflings. They are small and have long furry ears and are kind of a little feral or is regarded as such by the locals. And then there are the godlike. <clears throat> and the godlike are a strange, either blessed or cursed uh, kind of race of people. It's not really a race of people. They can be found among all the other races and they have a very unusual appearance and people generally regard them with some measure of fear and or awe. So we're gonna go with the standard human today. Uh, there are different sub-races or ethnicities of each of these main races. In the case of humans, the different sub-races are really just um, cosmetic differences. For the non-human races, they have more mechanical differences between them. And we have 11 classes that you can choose from. So again, in the Kickstarter campaign, we started with five core classes, the fighter, well, you start with the fighter, the wizard, the rogue, and the priest, as well as the ranger. And then over the course of the campaign, we expanded that out to include a lot of other classes. 
um, including the Chanter and the Cypher, which are two classes that we made at Obsidian. The Chanter is kind of like a bard in a lot of ways, at least conceptually, but mechanically they're, they're pretty different. And then the Cypher is more like a mental spellcaster, like a psionicist of sorts. Today we're going to be looking at a Barbarian. Barbarians are really great at doing area of effect melee damage. Uh, they're good for doing quick bursts of damage or high speed pursuit. Uh, and they're a lot of fun to play, so we're going to be taking a look at them. We have a standard six stat array for uh, attributes. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it felt traditional in the sense that there were six stats that you could buy up. Uh, we use a similar scale to the old games, um, but we did want to make sure that these stats felt like they were a little more balanced relative to each other regardless of what class you pick. So in this case, Brandon has built a character that might look a little unusual because he has a 14 might as a barbarian, but he also has a high intellect, 14 intellect. Um, the reason why this is actually a pretty good build in Pillars of Eternity is because intellect influences the duration of all of your abilities, including spells, but also just personal class abilities. And it also increases the area of effect of anything that you use that has an area of effect. So in the case of the Barbarian, the Barbarian has a number of abilities that have relatively short durations, like Frenzy or Wild Sprint. Those abilities have a longer duration with a higher intellect. And also the Barbarian has an area of effect through their Carnage attack. And Carnage, the radius increases based on a higher intellect. So if you want to make a brainy Barbarian, it actually can be a very effective character. Similarly, if you want to make a stupid, muscly wizard, you can do that. And that's actually a viable character in a different way. Of course, if you want to build a very traditional Barbarian, you can go with Might and Constitution or something like that. But the point is you can play against type and the game does not overly penalize you for doing so. Um, Role-playing is an important element in a lot of our games. We want people to define their character as much as they'd like to uh, from the beginning of the game. So right away you can decide what part of the world your character has come from. Because this is a colonial area, there's lots of reasons why you could come from all over the world to this place. Uh, this also has an influence not only on dialogue, but on the gear that you start the game with. So in this case, we're starting with an Edir barbarian who has hide armor and is dual wielding a battle axe and a sword but we can also pick someone from the Exomital Plains, and those barbarians tend to wear leather armor, spears, and use shields. So again, this does not restrict you to using this gear, but it is what you start the game with. Uh, we're gonna go with the, uh, the Eddier Barbarian, the more lightly armored guy right here. We also want to allow players to express where, what their characters were before they came to the Eastern Reach. So you can choose, oh, I was a hunter, I used to be a slave, oh, I was a con you know, I'm coming here to colonize this area. So um, these have just slight role-playing differences, so when you talk to people in certain conversations, you can reflect upon the background that you've selected. 2D portraits are, were a big part of the Infinity Engine games, especially Icewind Dale um, and also Baldur's Gate as well. So we wanted to allow people to uh, pick from a number of uh, cool 2D portraits we had developed, but also if players want to, they can import their own portraits. That was very popular in the old games, so a lot of people want to take their their Frazetta paintings or their <laughs> Larry Elmore's or their Keith Parkinson's and put them in there or just make their own art and throw them in there. So we do support that as well. Uh, when your character gets really teeny tiny on the screen, it can be hard to tell them apart. So we allow you to set your uh, primary and secondary cloth colors. Um, this stays with you when you switch gear so you can more easily tell your characters apart. And of course you can customize your hair and skin colors. You can customize your facial hair, uh, your head style and your actual just regular old hair. So again, this goes to just customizing the look and feel of your character right away. And then your voice set. So um, when you're selecting and commanding all of your characters, the voice set helps give feedback so you understand, oh yeah, my guy got my command, good times. And then of course, your name. <laughs> So, as I said, your caravan had to sit down for the night because of a fallen tree. They couldn't go any farther. Everybody, stay close to the wagons. Got it? Stay out of the woods. And Beast, take you if you are planning a stroll through those ruins up there. Whole areas crawling with hut-dwelling types who'd be happy to stick an axe in you for trespassing. So mind that you don't track mud on their sacred blazing rocks. Tonight, everybody stays put. In the morning, we'll get the path cleared. Gilded veils less than a day out. Understood. Let's get going before you keel over. Yes? <clears throat> Kalisha is a fighter and the character that we built is a barbarian. They're both warriors that focus on melee, but they play very differently. Um, 
The fighters are much more defensively oriented. They have very good deflection defense, which makes them hard to hit. They also regenerate stamina slowly over the course of a fight, and they're very reliable overall, very low maintenance. Barbarians are really good at doing group damage. Uh, they're great if you want to do a, sh a sharp burst of damage or if you want them to move very quickly across the battlefield, but they do require a little more maintenance and they're, in some ways they're a little more um, likely to go down in a blaze of glory in the middle of a fight. Um, but they're really fun to play. So uh, your initial choices with regard to your background and classes does determine your starting gear, but you can trade that out if you'd like. So in this case we bought an additional axe, so we're dual wielding battle axes and we have a pike. Uh, each weapon has its own base uh, effect that helps players sort of decide what, uh, what weapons they want to choose between. We wanted to make sure that all base weapon types were very viable. In this case, battle axes are, do really great critical hit damage, and pikes have increased range, which is good for a barbarian because if they get into the middle of a melee, sometimes they can take a lot of damage. Um, we were sent to go get some berries, but that guy down there, Sparful by the tree, um, he was sent to go get water to help us out. He's kind of notorious for being lazy in the camp, so he's just going to have a smoke <laughs> while we go off and get the berries. Uh, there are some wolves that are up here in these, near these outcroppings, so we have an opportunity to show off our combat a little bit. <laughs> Yes? Very well. So we finally got the spring berries and uh, Kalisha uses this as an opportunity to talk to you about your background. The choices that you made in character creation about where you came from and what your background was, she asks you to elaborate on that. And as a player, you can use that to flesh out where your character is from and why you came into the Eastern Reach. Of course, you can also tell her, I don't want to talk to you about this stuff. That's up to you. Um, but it does give the player an opportunity to kind of role play out uh, more about their character. So <clears throat> once, you get the, uh, once you get the spring berries and have talked to Kalisha, she says, you know, we've been here for a while. Sparful is supposed to give, go get the water, but he's pretty unreliable. So we should go check on him and make sure he's okay. And down by the water, we don't really find any trace of Sparful, but we do find that his water skin is left behind. So Kalisha said, well, we should just go get the water ourselves. What you're seeing right here is uh, something we call scripted interaction. These are things that we like to use in the story to um, just do storytelling moments from a different perspective, show things in the world in a way that you don't normally see them in an isometric game, using illustration, sound effects, and you know a lot of descriptive text. In this case, while we're filling the water, Sparful comes out of the forest. He's breathing heavily, walking strangely. It's because he's been shot in the back, and he drops over dead. <laughs> which is very bad because Sparful went too close to the ruins for the uh, locals. <clears throat> so now the locals who defend the, uh, who defend the entire area have decided that you need to be punished for going too close to the ruins. Kalisha is using one of her class abilities here. Fighters have the ability to knock enemies down. Unfortunately, she was not able to execute properly on that. That time she did. <laughs> and we wiped that guy out. All abilities that characters have in the game, typically, unless they're passive abilities, they have a limited number of uses, either per rest or per encounter. So Kalisha's ability uh, to knock enemies down, she can use that twice per fight. She failed the first time, she succeeded the second time. The Barbarian's Wild Sprint has a limited number of uses per rest. Once a fight ends, you get all of your per encounter resources back, um, but the per rest abilities, you have to rest to get them back. So that adds a strategic element to how you go into a fight. In this case, Kalisha is dealing with the two guys up front, but we have an archer off in the distance that we want to close in on very quickly. So the Barbarian is going to use Wild Sprint, and he can just rush through. Um, it's very difficult to stop him in that state. And now he can deal with the guy in the back rank. Uh -oh. Yes? Now that we dealt with the archer, we're going to dual wield battle axes and really cream these guys. So the, the big advantage of a barbarian is that when enemies are, are stacked up together like that, um, you can really do a lot of damage very quickly to both of them. 
because they do AoE attacks. So that's kind of the way to play a Barbarian, is to try to group enemies together and then uh, get the Barbarian to wade into yes. the middle of them. So we made our way back to the camp, and unfortunately these, uh, these raiders have made short work of the people in the, in the uh, camp. Um, almost all of them are dead, except for the guy that you bought your gear from, Hayden. And Hayden is being held hostage by the leader of these uh, local guardians. So there are a lot of different ways you can deal with this guy um, through this conversation. One thing I want to call attention to is that number two option, lore, is uh, dark red. <clears throat> so what that indicates is that your character does not have a high enough lore to actually get that option in dialogue. Um, it's optional. Players can hide that if they want a more sort of purist experience. But um, it does help the player understand that the different choices they make in building your character do, do have different um, impacts on how the conversations can play out. <clears throat> Also, on the right-hand side of a lot of these options, you can see that there are personality types listed, like honest, diplomatic, passionate, or rational. When the player picks those options, they're building a reputation for being a character of that particular type. Over the course of the game, you build those reputations, and people will start to react to that, um, either for good or for ill, depending on what sort of reputation you build and what sort of character they are. In this case, we're just going to start off and ask the guy what he wants and what he's done, what he's doing here. And it turns out he's really mad because we're trespassing in the sacred ruins and he wants us to surrender or he's going to kill the guy that he's holding hostage. The guy he's holding hostage tells us not to trust them because they're going to try to kill everyone. Um, so again, we have a number of ways that we can try to find our way through this conversation. Uh, we can also just tell him to screw off, like we're not, we're not letting go of our weapons. You're going to have to just deal with us as we are. Um, we, are we do have an option to try to intimidate him with our might. Um, and one thing I do want to call out is, unlike some of our other RPGs, when we show that a dialogue option has been unlocked, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing to choose. You have to kind of read the situation and the person and how they're going to react to something. So in the case of these fanatics, trying to intimidate them is not really working very well. So we can still select the option, but the man looks at you and he says, well, OK, I think I can take you guys out. <clears throat> and so he starts the fight by hitting Hayden in the back and injuring him pretty badly. So there they go, ganging up on Hayden. We're gonna use one of the Barbarian's other abilities, which is Frenzy. This is another really great ability of the Barbarian. You can see his attacks start coming in much, much faster. Um, again, because he is right in close to all these guys, he's doing a lot of damage to the group at once. So we're able to make relatively short work of the guys in the camp, um, and they seem a little bummed because they weren't able to take you out, but they sense that divine retribution is coming for you, at least what they believe is divine retribution, and that is coming in the form of what's called a Beowick. And a Beowick is a soul wind, and it is a very, very bad thing. <clears throat> as you can see here, a soul wind is something that actually tears the souls out of people's bodies as it washes over them. Very, very dangerous, um, lethal in fact. <laughs> So your entire group tries to run for cover and get out of the way of this uh, horrible phenomenon. As you're scrambling to safety, um, one of the dying Glonfothans, these defenders, they drag your buddy Hayden down to the ground, the guy you just saved. And this guy is trying to make sure that Hayden dies in the Beowick along with all the defenders. Um, depending on your class and the gear that you have, you have different ways to work your way out of the situation. Um, because you're playing a character that has a melee weapon equipped, you can use your melee weapon to throw it at the attacker, but you will lose your melee weapon in the process. Of course, you can also try to let hit and get free on his own, but it does not really work out very well for him. <laughs> and you very much can have characters die either in combat or in scripted interactions, depending on the choices that you make. So in this case, we throw our weapon, uh, the defender is hurt, and it allows Hayden to scramble free. You're able to grab his arm, pull him up the way, the rest of the way, and all three of you scramble into the ruins before the entrance collapses. So you did manage to escape to safety, but there are consequences for the choices that you made earlier on. Uh, Hayden is alive, uh, but you lost one of your weapons in the process, so you have to go back in and, excuse me, you have to go back in and equip uh, different sets of weapons if you want to keep dual wielding. So we're going to go with our sword and axe combo. And then Hayden is also pretty badly injured. He actually has a long-term injury. In this case, it's bruised ribs. There are a number of different uh, types of long-term injuries like twisted ankles, concussions, things like that. 
Um, those long-term injuries only go away when you rest, and resting is something that you have kind of you only do in a limited sort of fashion in the game, you, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So Hayden actually asked the group to stop. He's not feeling very well. Uh, he wants to rest. Kalisha has no interest in resting. Kalisha is very worried about being in the ruins. She's worried about what's in the ruins. She's worried that more of the Glonfothans are going to come and attack the group. Um, and Hayden says, please, please, I really got to rest. So you have a choice to make here. If you don't rest, Hayden is going to have to continue marching on with that injury that he has. <clears throat> but if you do rest, Kalisha will just abandon you in the ruins. Um, so the choices that you make sometimes can have fairly dramatic long-term consequences. In this case, we just told Hayden to suck it up and deal with it. <laughs> uh, we find an old camp here, and we're going to loot it and see what was left behind. And we find a hammer and chisel, which is a tool and camping supplies. Tools like the hammer and chisel and like these flint and tinders that we find, they can be used in scripted interactions and conversations to do special sorts of interactions. And then the camping supplies are what determines how you rest. So down below you see a little campfire with a number one next to it. Uh, that reflects how many times you can rest before you have to go back to either an inn or your stronghold to rest. Um, there are also places in the wilderness you can rest, but they're pretty out of the way and inconvenient. So uh, those camping supplies are used as a limiting factor to determine how far you can go before you really have to rest or retreat. So in this combat, we're dealing with this little dude, this Skulder. Skulders have a powerful uh, AOE stun effect. They're not very strong on their own, but they can attack uh, very quickly and do a little bit of damage while the characters are stunned. But once the stun ends, we're able to deal with them fairly quickly. In groups, they can be a real big hassle because they can stun the group very quickly. Uh, on this dead explorer, we find an Ingwithan relief gem, some leather armor, and another flint and tinder. You'll notice that we found a bunch of flint and tinder so far. Those are consumable items, so anytime you use tools and scripted interactions, they get used. So finding more of those tools is always kind of a handy thing. Uh, we have a puzzle here, a little floor puzzle, and there are a number of ways that you can either try to get through the puzzle or you can try to make your way around the puzzle. Um, in this case, we're going to try at first to have Head and our rogue go up and uh, spot the traps. You can see they start to get highlighted. Um, Hayden is good enough to spot most of the traps. He's only good enough to disable a few of the traps though. So once we start disarming a couple of the traps, we actually now have to go and try to find other ways to highlight and uh, remove some of the tiles on the floor. So Kalisha is calling out that the pillars have symbols on them that look very similar to the pillars that we saw, or the symbols that we saw on the floor in the other room. So interacting with the pillars, we can choose to use various objects that we found to light the braziers. Uh, we found a bunch of flint and tinders, we're going to use those and start lighting the braziers. As we light each one, the symbols in the other room, some of them stop glowing, and that helps us find a way across that's not going to horribly mangle the party. But of course, each time we interact and light one of these up, we're using one of the flint and tinders. So now that we've run out of flint and tinders, we have to resort to using our torches. So we've lit all the braziers, but there's still more to explore on this side of the ruin, so we're going to take a, take a little gander at what's up in the northwest corner here. Oof. <laughs> that was a... was that a crit? Oh yeah, that was really bad. So uh, yeah, these little oozes, um, they don't attack very often, but they have a really powerful ranged attack that does a lot of damage and it has a good chance of calling an interrupt. And an interrupt is any time a character gets hit, there's a chance that he'll play a hit reaction or she'll play a hit reaction and that will stop whatever current action they have. Kalisha just played one right there, which stopped her movement. You can also interrupt a spell or any sort of an attack that you're making. So we found this uh, weird relief with goop on it on the wall and we can interact with that. And in the scripted interaction, we can use our water skin from before. There are different uses for water skins in different scripted interactions. In this case, we can wipe the goop off, and that reveals uh, <clears throat> an eye socket that's been emptied uh, and with, from the gem. Basically, the gem that we found in the Dead Adventurer fits into this eye socket. So we can place that in, and it reveals a secret door in the far wall. side is another little ooze. Fortunately that one did not hurt us too badly. Okay. 
So now the ooze is dealt with, we can go inside and see what loot is inside, and we find a little <clears throat> cloak. It's actually hidden inside the secret room. And that cloak gives a defensive bonus, which is good for the barbarian. Barbarians, uh, especially the reflection is very low, but um, they tend to take a lot of damage, and when they're frenzying, their defenses kind of go down pretty quickly. And now we're gonna, since we've cleared this area, we're gonna go back and look at the puzzle again and see what good Hayden's trap investigation and our lighting the braziers has done. So you can still see there are the red outlines that show the traps that Hayden identified but was not able to disarm. Um, but the rest of our interactions allowed us to uh, find a path through. By all means. What you need? Yeah. Got it. Of course, if you do not disarm the traps and you just try to walk straight over them, it can be pretty bad. <laughs> so I want to call attention now to our, our health system. So you notice that Hayden's whole portrait filled with red and he fell down, but then he got back up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So every character has short-term health, which is currently called stamina, but we're going to be renaming to endurance because it's a little more intuitive. Uh, endurance is your short-term damage. Um, if you lose all your endurance in a fight, you get knocked out, uh, but it's not a huge problem. <clears throat> the green bar that's on the left side of the portraits is your health. That is long-term damage. If health hits zero, um, on lower levels of difficulty, your character will be maimed and then later killed if they take more damage. And on higher levels of difficulty, when it hits zero, they're just immediately killed. Yeah. So that's one of those things that, again, um, it helps to regulate how far your characters can go before they have to rest. All right, so now Kalisha is dealing with the spiders up front, but there's a big one way in the back. So we want to use our barbarian's wild sprint to zip to the back as quickly as he can. And now he's going to use his frenzy so he can hopefully make short, uh, short work of all these spiders. And as you can see, uh, with each attack, he's also potentially doing damage to the nearby spiderlings. Um, that means that the barbarian can really make short work of that group of spiders very quickly. And again, the best way to play those guys is to get in, get in to a large group of creatures and uh, really just start wailing away. Preferably while frenzy. <laughs> and so, of course, we come out the other side of the ruins, and unfortunately, all is not well. There you go, that's it, Pillars of Eternity. <laughs> That was Pillars of Eternity, and it is coming out in winter of 2014 for PC, Mac, and Linux.